All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to FWMD Live. It is Pride Month, and today we are going to have a discussion about how communication can help reduce healthcare disparities for the LGBTQIA plus community. And we have some very special guests joining us for this conversation today. It's going to be a good one. But before we get to that, I'm Prescott Stokes III, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm the Integrated Content and Marketing Manager here at the TCU and UNT HSC School of Medicine. And today I am very happy to be here with Chase Crossno joining us for our conversation. How are you doing, Professor Crossno? Happy Pride. I'm doing well, thank you. All right, happy pride, Chase. All right, I just want to let everybody know that Professor Crossnose pronouns are she, her, and hers. Now, Professor Crossno holds a master's degree in public health, and she is the assistant artistic director of narrative reflection and patient communication and an assistant professor of medical education here at the School of Medicine. She is also a part of the compassionate practice. A team that teaches the communications curriculum to our medical students. And we are also happy to have the other half of the Compassionate Practice team, Dr. Lauren Mitchell. How you doing, Lauren? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having us here and Merry Pride all. <laughs> all right. I just want to let everybody watching know that Dr. Mitchell's pronouns are she, her, and hers. And Dr. Mitchell has a PhD in English and she is an assistant professor and the director of narrative medicine at the School of Medicine. Dr. Mitchell and Professor Crossno both teach the compassionate practice curriculum at the School of Medicine, which focuses on medical humanities and communication skills for medical students who will one day be future physicians. And we are also happy to have our very special guest, Laurie Kramer joining us. How are you doing, Laurie? Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, we are so happy that you are here. I wanna let everybody know that Lori's pronouns are she, her, and hers. And she is one of the co-founders of the Safe Zone Initiative and is also a logistics lead at the Safe Zone Initiative. Now she handles all of the meetings, social media and marketing, scheduling contracts and invoices in her role at the Safe Zone Initiative. And she holds a master's degree from Nazareth College of Rochester. And in her most recent role, she was the director of education Education at the Out Alliance, where she led and co-facilitated LGBTQ plus inclusion trainings all across the U.S. Now, if you would like to be a part of our conversation today, it's really simple. Just jump into the comments with any questions or comments that you have, and then we will definitely get you some answers from our experts. But before we get to that, I'm going to start this conversation with Professor Crossnose. So people who are part of the LGBTI um, plus members, they are a very diverse group of people, right? They come from all walks of life and all back backgrounds and ethnicities. So how important is it for physicians to be trained to be culturally competent to provide better care for this community? Oh, great, great question. And I'm so glad that you started by acknowledging the diversity of this community, that it's, it's not just it doesn't look just one way. And so the short answer to your question is that it's very important that uh, medical students and physicians in training educate themselves about um, the unique needs of any community. Um, and I'm not sure how familiar our audience might be with the concept of intersectionality, but I'm just gonna throw it out there at the top, which is what you're getting at, which is that all of us wear play many roles in our lives and have various identities that intersect in different spaces in our lives. So I'm not just a white woman, I'm a white queer woman. And so all of those facets of my identity are at play in my life all the time. And that intersection makes, um, makes my needs particularly unique in certain ways, as would be the case with anyone. And at our school, we're actually really focused on a humility model even more than a competency model. And I wanna articulate that means that we approach people with humility versus believing that we know sort of checklist factors about their identities. You know, like you, the competency model in some ways can say, you can learn this list of unique stereotypical attributes about the LGBT community. And that's not realistic. 
Um, the humility model says, learn from the patient. Remember to consider yourself, um, sort of there's two experts in the room. There's you and your medical knowledge and expertise, and there's your patient who's the expert in their lived experience. So that's really the place to start is from a place of humility and recognition of your patient who's got a full, rich, dynamic life that you need to, to understand and dig into. And, you know, when you think about the certain stigmas and forms of, of discrimination that the LGBTQIA plus community face, um, Dr. Mitchell, how does that factor into the health care that they currently receive? Sure. So thank you for that question. So I think actually where uh, Professor Crossno left off, aka Chase, we usually go by our first names uh, with one <laughs> another and students, but we do appreciate the you titling us. Um, so right, patients come in to the doctor's office with full, rich, robust lives, whether or not they're LGBTQ. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, we've worked with our students in, in figuring out how to pin down some communication techniques when working with the queer community. And, a, you know, one of the ways that we've sort of framed it is, look, sometimes a patient is coming in for a, an issue that is relevant to their sexual and reproductive health, in which case you have to dig in. Sometimes they're coming in for a sore throat. But in either case, when a patient walks into the doctor's office, you know, this whole rich, robust life is important to them, including who we love and who we're intimate with. These are things that are part of what makes us human. So to ignore that or not give space to honor that or to completely let that go unquestioned, first of all, plays into the stereotype that the assumption, plays into the assumption that most people are heterosexual, AKA that everybody is heterosexual, which a lot of people are, but a lot of us aren't. And so we wanna shake up the fact that the default stance isn't that you're heterosexual or you're weird, right? It's, I mean, you're heterosexual or queer, arguably, that was a bad pun. Um, but it's also looking at it from the perspective of um, you have to give space for this whole life that comes into the office. So ultimately, stigmas and forms of discrimination, I mean, that's, they can come in a lot of different varieties, and that can come often in the form of, I needed antibiotics for my sore throat, and instead I had a weird conversation about my sexual habits that may or may not have had anything to do with this. Or to the other extreme, I walked in with my girlfriend and the doctor assumed that we were just friends and didn't ask anything about my sexual health history. And it's being, um, part of it's being a nimble communicator. You know, I, when we come to the doctor's office, I think most people, regardless of their sexual or gender identity can agree that coming to a doctor's office can feel quite vulnerable. Um, because you're either hoping that nothing is wrong with you or you're coming in to address something that might be. And when you then add in this other layer of that you're considered not normal, that you're considered other, right? That can up the ante on that vulnerability. Now that's also, the answer to this question could potentially be very long because that's also not even getting into the fact of what happens when you're a teenager and you're seeking gender affirming treatment, right? Or you don't have an ID that matches your name or your parents kicked you out and you're homeless and you don't have an address, which prevents you from getting all kinds of resources, including um, Medicaid or, you know, or anything like that. So it all ties together and we have to give space to the fact that because our medical and legal systems intersect in a way to not give space for people to express their true selves, that what ends up happening is that, you know, people can't access the health care that they need, whether that's the sore throat or the gender affirming care. And so actually, we're going to get a little bit more into that um, with gender, gender identity and, and also um, with 
teenagers um, and how they struggle with gender identity a little bit later in this conversation, but I'm glad that you brought that up, Dr. Mitchell. I just want to let everybody know this is FWMD Live if you're just joining us. It is Pride Month, and today we are talking about how communication skills and better communication skills can actually help reduce healthcare disparities for the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, if you have any questions, questions, just put them in the comment section, and I will definitely get you some answers from our panel of experts. Now, um, Lori, you you co-founded the Safe Zone Initiatives, and we've been talking about the, the patient and physician interaction and, and how you can kind of talk through some of those things, but let's take it a step back and think about just the outside community. Um, what are some basic communication skills that people can work on, like understanding the use of pronouns that, that we all kind of identified ourselves with our pronouns when we began this conversation? So how do you start to understand that, that kind of thing in the uh, local community? This is such a great question. And I'll say we actually run entire workshops all about respectful communication with the LGBTQ plus community. But I'd say in short, um, pronouns are something that everyone has. Um, it's not just LGBTQ plus folks who have pronouns. And one of my favorite things to do when meeting somebody is say, hi, my name is Lori. My pronouns are she, her. What pronouns can I use to respectfully address you? This helps us to kind of avoid those awkward conversations of like, well, uh, I don't really know how to address you or are you a girl? Or are you a boy? This way you're just saying, what pronouns do you use? I want to be able to respectfully address you when we're communicating. You know, it doesn't matter about somebody's, you know, personal, um, you know, personal, personal details. What we're asking them is how can we best respect them when we're talking with them? And, you know, just like I said, all people have pronouns. It's not just folks within the LGBTQ plus community. And by sharing your pronouns, I like to say that that is one of the biggest signs of respect and allyship within the LGBTQ plus community. This tells people, okay, I understand that not everybody might use the pronouns that I might assume. And by sharing my pronouns, it takes it off of our trans friends from always having to be the ones to share theirs. What it does is it normalizes it. I'll tell you the um, most uncomfortable thing that would ever happen if you shared your pronouns is you share your pronouns and somebody looks at you and they say, um, okay. But best case scenario, somebody else hears you and they're like, oh my gosh, this person is an ally to the LGBTQ plus community. This is somebody that is safe to come out to. This is somebody who understands that pronouns are something that can change from person to person. So um, a really great website actually, where you can actually practice using pronouns is a website called practicewithpronouns.com. Pretty standard, but it's a great place where you can practice using different pronouns like they, them, theirs, or these, them, their uh, to talk about people. But you know, at the heart of it, really just introducing yourself with your pronouns can just take a whole weight off of folks. And, and, and that's good information. We're going to put a link to that website, practicepronouns.com. So we're going to put that in the comments. And Lori, I just have another question. So when you think about the idea of using pronouns, um, for people who may feel as if, should I even start a conversation with, um, can you tell me your pronouns or something like that, because they may feel like it's awkward, is it okay to, to open a conversation up with someone if, if you feel like you should uh, want to use their pronouns. Definitely. You know, I think a huge issue within the LGBTQ plus community is oftentimes folks are not spoken to or they're ignored or they're, you know, just people don't even approach them because they're so afraid of messing up. And, you know, we're all human. We're all going to mess up. Um, you know, one of the things we say in our training is we say, who here has messed up someone's pronouns? And I always raise my hand. You know, you would think being a co-founder of an LGBTQ plus organization, I would never mess up somebody's pronouns. But you know, that's just something that we all do and it's natural. And the best way to handle it is sort of like you're bumping into somebody. Um, you know, if you're walking down the street and you bump into somebody, you're not gonna be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Do you need a bandaid? Is your shoulder okay? Because that's super dramatic. The person will look at you and say, uh, this is okay. Like calm down. They're like, you're literally fine. But you also don't want to just walk past and ignore it. So I like to say that you, when you misgender someone, you treat it just like you're walking down the street. You bump in and say, oh, oops, sorry. You acknowledge what you did and then do the work to do better next time. What that can look like when you're talking in the, uh, regards to pronouns is saying, oh, sorry, I know that your name is Lori and I know you use she, her pronouns. I'm going to do better next time. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're not avoiding conversation with the folks just because we're afraid we don't know what their pronouns are. And if you don't know, it's okay to ask. It's okay to say, hey, um, I would love to know what pronouns can I use to best respectfully address you. This comes across in such a very respectful way that you're asking because you're showing that you want to understand and you want to be respectful. 
And, and Lori, can you just tell us a little bit about why organizations like the Save Zone Initiative can be instrumental in helping local communities and workplaces become more inclusive spaces? Yeah, that is such a great question. So uh, the Safe Zone Initiative, we are actually a small LGBTQ plus education and consulting company. We started just back in 2020 of July. And um, our really main goal is to be able to, as we say, be the people that we needed when we were younger. Um, our goal is to go into all sorts of organizations like K through 12 schools, colleges, universities, healthcare agencies, nonprofits, corporations, anything you can think of and be able to have these conversations about creating a more inclusive and safe space for the LGBTQ plus community. One thing that we really like to say when we're going into different organizations is, you know, we're not here to change anyone's point of view, anyone's personal beliefs or values. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to do, uh, we're here to be able to have a conversation about how you can make your spaces more safe and more inclusive. You know, when you agree to work at this organization, what does your diversity and inclusion statement say? When we look at the state laws, what are some of the things that are in place um, that are protections for the LGBTQ plus community or that might not be in place? So what can you do as an organization to make all folks that you're working with or all clients that you're seeing feel safe? One of the big things that we do is anytime we go into a training for different companies is we really cater the content to match that organization. You know, the specific content that we may bring to, um, you know, new students that are entering into a college may be very different than that of a corporation that has like 200 plus employees that are navigating, you know, different interactions with folks. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to that respect factor, the understanding what are some things that LGBTQ plus folks might face and how can we break that barrier? How can we be allies and how can we be respectful and make sure that nobody has to go to work feeling unsafe? All right, that's wonderful information, Lori. So I just wanna let everybody know that this is FWMD Live if you're just joining us. Uh, today, it is Pride Month and today we're actually talking about how better communication skills can actually help reduce healthcare disparities in the LGBTQIA plus community. If you have any questions for our expert panelists, just jump into the comments, leave your question and I will get you some answers. So Lori brought up a very interesting point, Professor Cross. No, she, she talked about the DEI statement for, for businesses. And I've had conversations with our medical students and they talked about the importance of the mission statement and the DEI statement on a school's website when they were deciding what medical school they may want to go to. So when you think about medical students approaching their choice for a medical school like that, why is it important that medical institutions dedicate their time to, um, in their curriculum to helping young physicians understand things like pronouns and, and know that they're in an inclusive space when they decide to ch uh, choose that medical school? I think Lori put it really well, which is, is just making sure people feel included, respected, seen, valued, I mean, some of our identities are expressed externally and some of them are invisible, right? And if we don't make an effort to let people know that those, ide those invisible identities, those things that we don't always wear sort of right on our, on our outside, need, people need to know that it's safe to share those facets of who they are. And that's built into the fabric of an institution. That's built into... Um, something like a mission statement. It's built into the way that we address our classroom. Um, yes, it's important to develop curricular time specifically to unpack these, these issues in more detail, but it should be built into, like I said, the very fabric of, of the space that you're working in, that we're creating a culture that is inclusive of the diversity that we all experience day in and day out. And so you need to be explicit. It needs to be stated that this is a place where we welcome uh, this full range of diversity, diversity of ideas, diversity of sexual orientation, gender identity, race, ethnicity. Um, that diversity makes us better and everyone needs to be able to speak about it if we're all going to grow and be enriched by the full range of our, our lived experiences. Um, so it really needs to be baked in and then it is important to devote curricular time to having these conversations about how do you um, elicit important information about gender identity and sexual orientation? How do you um, ask questions that are respectful and appropriate? Uh, how do you, and what Laurie demonstrated really well, how do you apologize when you mess up? 
without making it about that person taking care of you all of a sudden, you know, or, oh no, I messed up and now I'm so, I'm so upset. And suddenly it's the other person <laughs> is like, no, it's okay. It's okay. You know, um, I loved that analogy of just you bump into someone, you acknowledge the mistake and you move forward so that the onus remains on you and that I'm gonna continue to kind of do this good work. Um, with our students, it, there shouldn't just be like, here's the one time that we talk about LGBTQ lives. Like this is the one dedicated session. Uh, we make it a point to, to demonstrate in various elements of the curriculum that it, this happens these are people's lives all of the time, any of the time. Like, it's not just one session where we're going to talk about transgender health. It needs to be a conversation longitudinally throughout their education in the way that it will exist in their real lives. So that deliberate intention to both attention uh, and intention to both um, how to bake it into the culture and then how to make sure it's a longitudinal learning experience where they, they revisit these topics time and time again so they can really practice these skills and, and build confidence in, um, in speaking with communities across, and, across any spectrum. Professor Cross, no, since, since you just talked about you know, how it should be in the fabric of, of what the medical students are learning, um, Dr. Mitchell, I want to kind of pitch this to you. And can you take us a little bit like behind the curtain of what actually happens in a classroom? So when you think about teaching some of our students techniques to navigate these, these conversations, can you give us an example of, of maybe like some of the exercises that you all do? Sure. So one big thing that we were able to do last year um, was that Chase and I were able to adopt some of the Fenway model, uh, Fenway, the Fenway Clinic in Boston. We were able to adopt the Fenway model of taking a comprehensive sexual health history, which is very inclusive of pronouns and preferences and pleasure. Um, so I'll also say, if you... I don't know who's out there who may have worked in sexual and reproductive health in the past, but if you have, you may have noticed that the typical history checklists that you get are a little punitive. It's very talking about sex and gender in the context of unwanted pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections. There's a train behind me as I'm saying this for which no greater metaphor is necessary. Um, but it's all of these things, all of these very bad things that can happen, right? Or thinking of thinking of uh, sexual health and gender identity in terms of risk. So what we admire about the Fenway model is how it flips that. Um, and if it starts to get hard to hear, Chase, maybe you can talk more about the Fenway model. Is that, can you hear me despite the train? Yeah, you can pick it up, Professor, Professor Cross. No, you can pick up um, where she's going with, with that technique. Sure. <laughs> the train. <laughs> um, it's, it's a celebratory pride train. That's what that is. Right. Um, so the Finway model makes sure to include something as, as simple as pleasure in someone's uh, sexual health experience. So one of the challenges of sexual history gathering is that sometimes it, it takes a kind of punitive edge where it can feel a little like it's coming from a judgmental place, which I think is what makes sometimes um, our medical students uh, nervous about asking these questions is that it can feel like you are um, coming from a place where you're, you're making judgments about someone's life and choices. And what's nice is that this model opens these questions up to be, to be much more inclusive of the full range of sexual health experiences, which includes anything from, of course, uh, sexually transmitted infections and things like this, but also pleasure and preferences in practices. So it's, it's a really nice model because it's, it, it acknowledges sex and relationships as a part of our lives beyond um, maybe the more punitive elements or aspects that sometimes come to mind for people like prevention of, you know, something that we don't want, but it's also inclusive of things that we do want and that we do enjoy. Um, Lauren, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Now that the train has left. Yeah, I think it's also interesting because, um, you know, a lot of like the, 
the punitive peas, as it were, like the typical sexual health history gathering questions. You know, it what that does is it falls in the realm of pathologizing sex and gender. So anything that isn't cisgender or you're born female and you identify as female today, that's cisgender, you identify as the gender you were born with. You know, it's um, anything outside of the cisgender heteronormative sexual encounter tends to get pathologized. Like it's different, it's other, it's bad. And, you know, we live in a society that is a little squeamish about sex and about gender and about things that can be perceived as abnormal with regards to sexual practices. So the Fenway model does a really lovely job of, um, giving providers a structure so that way they can't fall into where a lot of us might be more comfortable, which is pathologizing those things. Like you don't want, you want it to stick to something medical. You don't want it to go outside of that. And, and actually that's, that's really great information. And we've put that in the comments so you can learn more about the Fenway model. And I, I, I want to kind of scale it down from medical students to actually the parent child relationship little bit. So are there some tips and, and techniques that parents can use to teach their children about how to navigate these topics? Because they may be um, confronted with these topics even when they're in school, right? In middle school or high school. This is one of my favorite questions. I think oftentimes when we think LGBTQ+, we always think about um, sex, but, you know, being LGBTQ+, plus is so much more than that. You know, sometimes folks will say, well, I don't know, like, if my kids are too young to talk about this. You know, we say if your kids are able to learn about straight couples, they're able to learn about LGBTQ plus couples as well, or LGBTQ plus people. You know, when we're talking about what it means to be LGBTQ plus, we're talking about who someone is. Uh, we actually do this exercise within our organization called the Components of Us, which really looks at, you know, what is our gender identity? What is our gender expression? You know, what is our orientation? It's not talking about, you know, things that are happening in the bedroom. It's talking about what our identity is. Um, some of my favorite ways to talk to kids about this are actually through books. There is a really great book that I want to share called Red, A Crayon Story. And this is all about a crayon who has a bright red label. The crayon is red, but can't the crayon can't stop drawing blue. And, you know, spoiler alert, the crayon is transgender. It's supposed to represent someone who's trans, but uh, they don't say that at all in the book. They're just talking about sometimes folks outside don't match their inside. You can start from a very, very young age talking to your, you know, your kids at home or your youth in general about how sometimes people's outsides don't match their insides or talking about, you know, some families have two moms and some families have two dads or, you know, any sort of combination of that. You can talk to people about what does it mean to treat everyone with respect? When we say everyone and all, what does that actually mean? And when we talk about, you know, treating everyone the same versus treating everybody um, equitable, what does that actually look like? You know, that, uh, that idea of, oh, let's treat everyone the same. It has a good, um, it has a good intention, but what we really want to do is treat people with the resources that they need to succeed. So um, having those conversations from a young age through books, there are so many awesome book lists um, out there that exist. If you just search like LGBTQ plus youth books that really talk about talking to your kids about this. And even just from a young age, just saying, hey, I just want you to know that um, gay is not a bad word. You know, when I was growing up in school, I had two moms and whenever people would call each other gay, my teachers would just shut it down and say, oh, we don't say that here. So in my mind, I translated gay to being a bad word. And then I wish, what I wish when I had grown up is that folks had said, actually, gay is the way that people identify. Is a gay is actually how some people um, identify and who they are. And it's not a bad word. And talking about that and taking that opportunity to not just talk about LGBTQ plus stuff um, when it's a problem, but also just in general, just like Chase said, you know, it's not a one-time conversation. It's something that we want to talk about and normalize throughout all conversations, not just when there becomes a problem. And, and Laurie, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that point of the idea of, um, you know, turning words like like gay into negative words or giving them a negative connotation. I had the same experience, um, you know, going in middle school and high school in the, the 90s and early 2000s that that was the way that people approached the word, right? Like every time they used it, it was used as like a bad thing or a negative connotation. So I'm glad that there's organizations like the Safe Zone Initiative that's helping to change that and, and reverse that stigma and, and, and get rid of it. Um, one other thing I did want to talk about that we touched on a little bit is about 
um, gender identity. Now, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, mental health continues to be an area of concern for the LGBTQIA community. And one of the main drivers of that is depression, bipolar disorder, and anxiety about revealing their gender identity and coming out. Now, in the past week, the NFL had um, Oakland Raiders defensive lineman Carl Nassib come out on social media for Pride Month. You also have NBA um, stars and legends like Dwayne Wade openly supporting his daughter, uh, Zaya Wade. So how important is it for these kind of things to become normalized to kind of reduce those kind of uh, stigmas and, and, and depression and anxiety for LGBTQIA plus members, Lori? Yeah, it is incredibly important. You know, um, one model that we like to use sometimes in our trainings is the CAST model of coming out. And this is a model that was developed back in the late 1970s. So it's definitely outdated. Um, it comes from a very privileged perspective. It is definitely very whitewashed, but we like to really pick it apart and look at that one specific stage within the identity model of tolerance and how that stage of tolerance can be very, very dangerous for folks. You know, if you're finally coming to that place where you're like, all right, I think this is who I am. And then you're looking out into the world and you're turning on on the TV and you see, oh, somebody else, um, LGBTQ plus just was murdered or somebody else just um, was kicked out of their school or fired from their job. You're not going to want to come out. It's going to be scary. You're going to say, is this a safe time for me? Is this a safe place? But then if you turn on the TV and you see super awesome people like Laverne Cox or folks who are really leaders in the LGBTQ plus community thriving and, you know, providing leadership and empowerment for your community, you're going to say, oh my gosh, that is possible. That is somebody that I I can be. One of the big things that we say within our organization is that uh, we really like that the three of us are all from the LGBTQ plus community. So we like to speak from our experiences. Our primary goal of starting the organization was to be able to pave the way for LGBTQ plus youth to know that it's going to get, it's going to be okay. You know, especially in those younger years when you're growing up um, and you're afraid of maybe being kicked out of your home or maybe uh, your parents won't pay for college or maybe you won't have anywhere, you know, won't have anywhere to live. And if to pick between being your authentic self or having somewhere over your head, you know, it's hard to pick that. And our goal is to be able to show people that, you know, you can have both. You can have an awesome life and be someone in the LGBTQ plus community. They don't have to compete against one another. And that, you know, um, sorry, I just want to make sure I answer the, the full question. <laughs> sorry, I get, I get really excited. Um, but that, well, I'm going to, I'm going to just pass it on because okay. <laughs> I, I can no, go on this for a while. Really you know the thing about it that's it's just really great information and I'm glad that you're really passionate about the work that you're doing and 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 actually just talking about this topic because I think that is that is what people in the community need to hear um I, I do want to ask a question to Professor Crossno and Dr. Mitchell because you know at the medical school we have student interest groups for all the medical specialties right and then we also have um student interest groups for Asian Americans we have student interest groups for Jewish Americans, African Americans, and we also have a pride student interest group. So um, how do you all just talk to uh, medical students about being comfortable with, with being open about their gender identity while they're going through medical school? Um, Chase, you, you can begin first, Professor Crosmo. Yeah, so as I've mentioned already, it, it's gotta be kind of baked in. And um, you know, I am open about my my sexual orientation in a way that I think is important is sometimes just like um, Lori was saying, seeing it in, in, in the entertainment industry, I think it's the same in terms of seeing it in and among your, your faculty and other people who are in positions of leadership and power. It's important to, to students to see, you know, themselves represented in the people that are educating them and, and, that for me is an important element of, of being clear and candid about my identity and um, my experiences as a way of, for, for students to know that they've got someone that they can come and speak to. Um, it's, it's part of it being uh, the fabric of, of the community and the culture that, that we're building. And, and Dr. Mitchell, I, I know a lot of our uh, faculty and staff members have had safe zone trainings. And so some of their offices are safe zones for students, faculty and staff to come and have conversations. So when you think about students that are part of the Pride uh, Student Interest Group, um, how how good is it that they have a space where they can come and talk to people like, like Professor Crossno and like yourself? 
sorry, I muted because of the trains. Very good. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it normalizes things, right? And it's, it's one of those things where um, I'll share a very quick anecdote, you know, I was living in a hippie house in my early 20s and with like seven other people who I was very close to. And during that time, within a year, five of the eight of us realized that they were not born into the correct gender and they transitioned over the year. And for me, what that taught me, because, you know, everyone in the house was from the queer community, but um, you know, it was boot camp and learning about how how to regard that process with humility and how to force myself to always be open to learning, especially because we know that language evolves, how people identify evolve. I feel like even as recently as a couple of years ago, I learned so much um, from a very dear friend of mine about being asexual and it was a sexual identity and even gender and orientation and a queer engagement that I hadn't really thought of too much before. So I think a big part of it is like, we're here to provide support. We are as faculty of service to students, but also through that service is an openness to learning and an openness to the fact that, you know, this evolves so quickly and with generation z doing the awesome things that they're doing that ultimately we also have to be the students as well as you know the faculty all right wonderful information and on that note that will do it for today's fwmd live chat i want to thank everybody on facebook for watching and being a part of today's live chat and I also want to give a special thanks to all of our guests, Dr. Mitchell, Professor Crossno, and Lori. I definitely appreciate you all taking the time out of your schedules to joining us for this conversation this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, yeah. happy Pride, everyone. Get out there and enjoy it. Do something fun. Um, celebrate each other. Yeah, once again, Thank you for watching today's episode, and we will see you all soon. Hi, my name is Lori Kramer, co-founder of the Safe Zone Initiative. My pronouns are she, her. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.